Welcome to Employability Skills, a webinar for the NCDA constituency for private practice, business, industry, and agencies. Our presenters today are Courtney, Harold, and Robert. This webinar was coordinated by Dr. Sharon Gibbons, the NCDA trustee for private practice, business, industry, and agencies. And my name is Marie Smith. I'll be your tour guide throughout the webinar today. Let's get started. Employability Skills. Hi, thank you for participating in this webinar about employability skills across the generations. My goal is to give you some tips that may help you to work with your clients who may be struggling against age discrimination, either in the workplace or in hiring practices. And discrimination doesn't just happen with our more seasoned professionals. It also can happen with our younger professionals. So don't believe the hype but let's get into it. When we talk about employability skills, there are many different definitions that we can look at. And as I was doing my research in order to get this webinar prepared, employability skills are defined in a lot of different ways. This framework seems to be a pretty good summary of the different aspects of employability skills that we consider. Everything from interpersonal skills to critical thinking skills, resource management, technology, personal qualities, employability skills can obviously encompass a lot of things. Leadership. As you see these different skills pop up on the screen, start to think about the various stereotypes that are associated with different generations in the workplace. Of course, our more seasoned professionals are, are told that they don't learn anything new anymore and they don't have the computer and technical literally, literacy skills. Our younger professionals are given a hard time for lack of communication, lack of confidence, lack of emotional intelligence. It seems like no matter where we are on that spectrum, somebody has something negative to say about us. So as we look at some negative stereotypes, we're going to break it down into two categories. Now, I know that this is oversimplifying it, but I figured this would be easier than trying to break it down by baby boomers, Gen X, uh, millennials, Gen, Gen Z, all of that. So I've really broken it down into two categories here, seasoned professionals and early career professionals. So let's look at some of the stereotypes. Seasoned professionals are seen as being less motivated. We're too busy winding down to retirement to really be looking at something new. We are ready for the status quo. We're used to doing things our way. Um, and of course, as we start to get older, we start to have health problems and people are wondering if we can do anything without drooling all over ourselves. Early career professionals, though, are looked at as having a lack of interpersonal skills and low self-esteem. They're known as the fact finder generation. Ask any millennial to answer a question for you and they'll immediately whip out their phone and be able to find the answer from a fact perspective. But the concern with the younger generation is that they then don't have the skills to know what to do with that information once they have it. There's this lack of innovation and creativity. They're great for getting the facts, but then again, don't know how to apply those facts in a business situation. Well, don't believe the hype. Now, while in some cases these stereotypes are true, where it really becomes problematic is when we start applying those stereotypes to ourselves and buying in to those stereotypes. I've had many clients in the past where at our first meeting where we're talking about um, what their struggles are, what their concerns are, where they're the ones saying, oh, I'm too old, nobody's going to want me. And if we have that in the back of our own heads, then it's going to be hard in an interview or sitting in front of a potential employer to be able to convince them that age isn't a factor when we don't really believe it ourselves. And so part of today's presentation is going to be giving people ways to overcome those stereotypes, both outwardly and also internally, so that they don't buy into their hype about themselves. So let's talk about early career professionals in the actual job search. They want to be able to double dip learning and execution. And so in the career search process, they need to identify their weaknesses and seek and embrace mentors, whether long-term or 30-minute mentors. I've had some clients in the past who have done a great job of asking people to be a 30-minute mentor to them. 
most people understand what mentor means, but putting the 30 minute on it means that I'm not asking for a long-term commitment from you. I just have a few questions that I'd like to ask where maybe you can help me uh, develop myself professionally. Also look at nano learning. Our younger generation is brought up in the world of immediate gratification. So 15 minute TED talks, short articles, um, there are all kinds of videos and things out there on YouTube that, where they can learn in five minutes on their phone while sitting on the train on the way into on the way into the office. In interviews, they want to ooze confidence, even though they have fears. It's they can address those fears, but then talk about how it doesn't phase them now. They have learned how to address those things and move beyond it, and the fear no longer exists. In addition to identifying their own weaknesses, they need to look at really doing some analysis and problem solving rather than just providing the facts. So when they're looking at potential employers, have them analyze those employers as opposed to just researching the employers. Researching the employers can give them lots of facts about when the company came around, their financials, who the, the muckety mucks are in the organization. But what they really need to be looking at is the organization itself. What problems does this organization have that may need to be addressed and make proposals to solve those particular problems? In doing so, they're showing that they can get beyond the facts and really start um, thinking about that information in a way that is going to drive a company forward. Also, they need to think about branding beyond their competencies. Simon Sinek has a great TED Talk that, where he talks about starting with why looking at why we do what we do, what is it that drives us in the careers that we've chosen rather than just the skill sets and the education that we have. In that case, they are branding themselves beyond just the competencies. When they're up against other people for the same jobs, everyone's going to have the same competencies. And so talking about why they do what they do um, gives them the opportunity to stand out from the others who basically have the exact same skill set. They also need to develop offline communication skills. You know, we've all laughed about sitting in a room with younger generation where they're three feet away from each other texting. It's important for them to network outside of their peer groups. You know, network with some more um, experienced professionals. Practice presenting. Be a YouTube influencer. Go to to Toastmasters. Go to alumni events. Do things where they are practicing communicating without using their thumbs on a phone or their fingers on a keyboard someplace. And then finally, volunteer. This is a generation that really wants to make a difference in the world. And so getting out and doing some volunteer work, they're naturally going to be networking or involved with people outside of their peer groups and getting to know what that communication style is in this sort of hybrid between a work situation and a social situation. Now, once they are hired, those of you who are in organizations and who are the employers, you wanna help create employee experiences that develop these soft skills so that when you have hired employees from the younger generation, that they stay, that they can thrive starting with maybe conducting job simul simulations that involve working closely with others, others to solve some task. Um, and obviously working closely with others, hopefully we'll be working with people who are in some of the more experienced roles. Create internal crowdsourcing networks that allow these early career professionals to work on smaller pro projects and expose them to cross-functional and even global experiences. They are great learners. They, um, the, the younger generation is hungry for coaching. They're hungry for mentoring. They are hungry for knowledge. They acknowledge what some of their weaknesses are in terms of that knowledge base and the communication and all of that. So giving them the opportunity to practice what they're learning can go a long way with them. Utilize technology. We talked a little while ago about the nano learning and the short, um, short snippets of learning. But also, anytime you can provide simulation and gamification to develop those soft skills during onboarding and beyond, you can engage these early career professionals more and help them assimilate more into the organization and start to make a difference sooner rather than later. You want to expose them to a variety of senior leaders. Often in our organizations, we 
either consciously or subconsciously set up buffers between our early career professionals and our vice presidents and, and above. We let our middle management be the go-between. But it's important that our early career professionals also interact with the higher level executives so that they can understand what that looks like. What is executive presence? What are their careers potentially going to look like down the road? Now let's go to the opposite end of the spectrum with the seasoned professionals. These are our folks who are really worried about age discrimination when they are looking at getting the jobs that they're going after. We want them to mobilize their networks and send out the scouts. Too often, our seasoned professionals think that they need to be networking with the, uh, the people in their generation, be networking with the CEOs, be networking with the executive level people. But so many of our companies now are being run by you know, mid-career professionals, by the younger generations, and they need to be able to show that they are still relevant and that they will be a good cultural fit in those organizations. So the more they can network with well-respected earlier mid-career professionals or even have those people be recommendations for them, it helps companies to see the uh, relatability and, uh, and relevance of the older generation in the workplace. They want to skill up. A lot of times my clients talk about, oh, I'm able to learn quickly. Well, don't tell me you're able to learn quickly. Do it. Go learn something new. The bullets that you see here are different websites um, and different places that have free, if not uh, um, low-cost learning experiences. And for some of our older professionals to be able to say, not only am I willing to learn it, but in the past six weeks, I have gotten this certification or I have really paid attention to artificial intelligence or I've learned something new about fintech. Whatever it may be, encourage them that while they are looking for those next roles, that they skill up. Don't just talk about learning, do it. We want them to focus on helping rather than on saving the world. Often um, when we have so much experience, we go into jobs talking about how we're going to go in and make changes and we're going to make this a great place. But if we can change the, the perspective from which we tell that story to helping the current executives or helping the employees develop in their roles, um, talking about how we bring the wisdom of our experience to lift other people up, not just us coming in to, to change everything. And then don't ignore the obvious. Now, obviously, on our resumes, we are not including jobs that were 30 years ago. But once in an interview or even before, if the employer has looked at your LinkedIn profile, it has a picture on it, we don't want to ignore the obvious. There are positives about being at the more experienced end of, the, uh, of your professional development and use that. You know, you're in good health. You're ready to hit the ground running. My kids are all grown up and out of the house. I'm not going to have family distractions. Um, those kinds of things. So think about the specific positives that you bring to the table in being a more seasoned professional and help your clients to verbalize those in interviews and such that make them sound both relevant as well as um, the age being a positive in being hired. Mine age-friendly employers. Uh, retirementjobs.com has a list of certified age-friendly employers. These are companies that look beyond that, that look beyond the age and are in some cases purposefully hiring people who are closer to the end of their careers than to the beginning because they recognize the wisdom and the experience and the positive characteristics that come with that experience. Overall, we just need to embrace the difference. We need to create symbiotic workplace relationships. There are lots of things that the younger professionals bring to the table. There are lots of things that our more experienced professionals bring to the table. But occasionally in conversations, there seems to be this impasse and um, just a lot of talking about, oh, you know, the, the, the millennials don't have any drive and, you know, they don't really care and they leave whenever they want to. Well, what we haven't seen or what, what we haven't taken into account is the fact that they leave when they want to because they've gotten their job done during the day. 
They work very efficiently. They're very smart. They, they don't feel like they need to sit in the office and waste time. If, if you can complete a task in five hours rather than eight, then do it in five hours and go home. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, as I mentioned earlier, you know, some of us older professionals are looked at as not being able to do anything without drooling all over ourselves. We're going to be sticks in the mud. Well, we need to uh, be able to convince people that not only can we learn, we still thrive on learning. We're not, um, we don't have one foot in the grave. We are, we are continuing our careers and want to continue to make a difference in things. And so in the workplace, we want to emphasize individual development regardless of career stage and encourage each individual to develop a broader set of skills, no matter which end of the spectrum they fall on. We want to create opportunities for knowledge transfer in both directions, setting up those um, mentor relationships, um, setting up weekly short web meetings for people to share ideas, again, giving access um, to upper level executives for our younger professionals and vice versa, giving our executives the opportunity to learn from some of our younger professionals just creating those both informal and formal interactions across professional generations. It can be done. Um, younger professionals and more seasoned professionals can work very easily in the workplace and make things uh, and, and do it effectively, but it doesn't necessarily just happen naturally. We need to create the opportunities for that to happen, both in our hiring practices as well as in um, the workplace itself. So I hope I've given you a few ideas on how to help your clients maybe work through some of the concerns regarding age discrimination. Um, again, thank you for taking the time today to participate in the webinar, and I hope you have a great day. Hi, my name is Harold Mays. I'm with the South Carolina Department of Juvenile Justice. I am the program manager for the career and business development. On behalf of my colleague, Mr. Robert Snipes, who is the program coordinator for the Job Readiness Training Center, we would like to give you a brief uh, understanding of how we deploy employability skills for our justice-involved youth. First, this will be the outline in which we will follow, who we serve, what we do, when we do it, where we do it, why it's important for us to do what we do, and then how we bring it all together. First, who do we serve? We serve those individuals, primarily those that are classified as juveniles that have been justice <coughs> involved clients. Uh, with the Department of Juvenile Justice. Later on in the briefing, I will tell you how they enter our system. But these young people that we serve, our clients, they have been considered of many different names, anything from convict to felon, inmate, detainee, probation or parolee. But the most, but the bottom line is they have had some justice involved either in the beginning of the system, in the middle of the system, or towards the end of the system. The ages could range anywhere from 12 years of age all the way up to 21, 22, 23 years of age, depending on the crime and when they enter our system. Juveniles are those that commit a delinquent act, and if they're under the age of 18, Anything over that, they would be considered as an adult. But the bottom line is we, the services that we use, the products that we use can be used for those that would be considered youth or juveniles and those which would be considered adults that are out of the juvenile catchment. What we do. The what that we do is we provide career readiness and employability skills. This is our mission for the Job Readiness Training Center. The mission is quite simple. It is to equip, expose, and assist those youth with employability skills throughout the state. Our formula is E2C2. 
We equip them with the soft and hard skills required to get a job or education, expose to them to, them to different occupations and career and education opportunities. And probably the most important is once they have attained a job or have a career track, is assisting them in maintaining that trajectory on that career path. You may ask the question, what is the what that we do? And it can be simply put with, in corporate America, in order for a business or an organization to be successful, they must do one or two things. They must produce a product or provide a service. Here at the South Carolina Department of Juvenile Justice, we do both. The product that we produce are those young people that are job and career ready for the global labor marketplace to enter the workforce. The services that we provide are career readiness skills and employability skills to those youth. First, let's start with the career readiness skills. We look at this block of uh, skills that we, per we provide services for are uh, knowledge skills. That is knowledge of self, knowledge of career, and knowledge of success or career strategies. First, knowledge of self. And we do this in two different ways. One, we look at, we assess the juvenile, we assess the client to say, who are you? Where do you see yourself? What do you see yourself doing? And when do you see yourself doing that? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What are some of your interests? And then most importantly, how does all of these translate into the real world, into the real marketplace? Some of the ways that we assess or provide the skills that we would consider knowledge of self is we have deployed the seven effective habits by Franklin Covey. And some of you may not be aware, but Franklin Covey has developed a seven habits for those that are what we would call inside, inside a secure environment. And so we have deployed, this is a major platform for what we do and how we introduce knowledge of self skills for those that are in our, under our supervision. The next is knowledge of career path in careers. And one of the ways that we actually do that is we use programs such as the WIN, SCOIS. We provide, we use the Holland Career Assessment. We focus on we have the uh, clients to focus on those uh, career choices that are exciting to them. Um, we ensure that they conduct informational interviewing, um, internships, some of those internships are paid. We have the clients to produce what we call a glide path, a glide path to success. And then we develop career plans or transitional plans before the student actually leaves. One of the, some of the ways that we do, we provide these knowledge of career path is we use the Holland Career Assessment and uh, we are able to do this using the ASVAL testing. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move through the, the uh, presentation. The SCOIS is the South Carolina Occupational Information System. And the great thing about this system, it's been around since 1977, and it's free to all of those career and educational organizations within the state. Uh, one of the great things about the uh, SCOIS is that it's an online system. You're, uh, we're able to assess career assessment, college information, college majors, career clusters, uh, financial aid information, private and public trade schools, career videos, 
uh, salary, salary outlook, lesson plans for, for us to use, and accountability reports for not only the, the administration, but also for the parents. And this is a free service for us that we use um, that's provided by the state. As I mentioned before, the Holland Career Assessment, uh, we are, are able to use the ASVAL testing. And the ASVAL testing is something new and improved because, yes, it's for the military battery uh, assessment test, but also the second part of the ASVAL test is they administer the Holland Career Assessment, which is which is key for us, and we can do that. And they send out a trained uh, facilitator to administer that particular assessment. So that frees up staff. The wind testing and the work keys testing, we use that as well to ensure that our students are what we would call career ready. And that's free to our agency as well. The last part of that is what we would call knowledge of career strategies or knowledge of what we would call success. In this, we ensure that the student has the skills that they need to attend college, progress in their career choice. Uh, we actually uh, have mock interviews. We conduct career fairs, job fairs, college fairs. Uh, we have face-to-face -face interviews, even behind the fence. And so this is how we provide those services. Probably one of the, the big things that we do, we ensure that all students that leave have what we call a transitional plan. And this plan starts the day that they enter our facility and doesn't stop until the student is off of supervision plus another 30, 60, 90 days as part of the aftercare plan. Secondly, the employability skills. The employability skills uh, is part of the services that we provide. As far as critical thinking and problem solving, we use a, a program that is one of the best practices. It is called Tackling the Tough Skills, uh, and that's our, one of our main programs for our basic soft skills training that we use across the board. Another one is called the EARN program, which is earn the right to be employed or to provide um, uh, advanced job placement and maintaining employment. We also use teamwork and collaboration skills, and we do that behind the fence with what we call work programs. We have work programs that we evaluate the students on their collaborating skills and also their their team working skills within each other doing these work programs. Um, we use educational leadership. We are one of the few juvenile justice programs, or we was one of the first programs actually, to actually have a junior ROTC programs that really test and provide leadership skills for our students just as though they were out in, in the community. Uh, we look at the work ethics of them through the work programs. Uh, one of the things that's not on this slide that we don't do so well, and that is our ability to select and use information technology. As you can imagine, we have limitations to accessing um, advanced technology or even the basic technologies that most uh, youth are able to utilize in the community. So if we could do anything better opportunities for improvement for our agencies when we talk employability skills is being able to um, a lot easier to access um, programs uh, through information technology while they are in a controlled environment. Another big thing that we do when employability skills is we ensure that our students once they get here, if they don't have a valid state ID, then we uh, ensure that they obtain a state ID. Also, if they're here long enough and they're eligible, we will test them. And we have certified testers that is a part of our agency that can test them for their beginner's permit. And we're working on getting the students their 
driving credentials as well. We're working through a third party to make sure that that happens. When do we do this? Well, what we call there's many transitional points for uh, students to actually enter our system. There is, this is a roadmap to how the transitional points within the Department of Juvenile Justice. First, there is the beginning, the referral process once they come into our care or have committed an offense. Secondly, they enter what we call the court system. From the court system, they determine if they will continue on further in the system or if they will be placed on probation um, or they will be committed or they will handle the case, what we call informal, dismiss, or diverted. And then the last part of that, they will leave our system either from the dis dismissal or diverted way or they will leave the system through releasing um, through parole or coming off of what we call the end of supervision, uh, community supervision with probation. Where do we provide the services? We have what we call teen after school programs. We have uh, 45 of those statewide. And as you can see from the map, we have an array of those. If you can look very, very closely on a high population density area, we have anywhere between four up to, to eight sites in some of our larger counties. And then some of our smaller counties that we don't have the density, we may have one or may not have any uh, because of the geographical density of what, where most of our clients come from. And your teen after school program is very much similar to an after school program where we provide the soft skills training and getting students ready for our next program, which is the job readiness training sites. And these are the sites that we offer uh, what we call paid internships. So what, di what the difference between the after school program and the JRTs uh, is the JRTs provide paid internship anywhere between 50 to 100 hours of paid internship to for those older students that are transitioning into the workplace or transitioning into higher education. The reason why we do what we do is fairly simple. We are trying to divert the prison pipeline. Um, How do we do it? We have a lot of different uh, items or tools in our toolbox. One of those, as you can see on the screen here, is what we call our, our menu list. We call this our hot and ready. These are our programs that in the spare of a moment we have ongoing or we can stand up these programs uh, very similar to Little Caesar where you come in and you got your pepperoni and your cheese pizza ready to go. Uh, these programs are always ongoing and we can um, plug and play these programs anywhere in the state at any given time. We leverage our staff, our paid staff with volunteers to help to implement and facilitate these different trainings. Uh, one of the things I like for you to pay attention to is the earn, which is empathy, attitude, respect, and knowledge. This is this this here is our advanced soft skills training, our job readiness training, our career readiness training that is all is higher and advanced and more in detail than your regular soft skills training. This is how you maintain employment, how you maintain your pursuit for higher education. The next one I'd like to bring your attention to is the uh, Surf Safe. Uh, we offer the Surf Safe and we're starting to offer the Food Handlers course. And uh, that will soon be added to this course menu list as well. Financial literacy, we work hand in hand with financial institutions, banks, credit unions. One of our biggest credit uh, 
partners when it comes to financial literacy is found as Federal Credit Union that is local to this state, but um, they provide a lot of the services. And that's just one of the banking institutes that actually provide services for us here in the state, for our agency. As I mentioned before, the career exploration program, or better known as the ASVAL testing, um, there is actually two parts of that. One is the military battery test, but the other part is a career readiness assessment that's used, the Holland Career Assessment, that is used to ensure that anyone going into the military is placed in the right skill or interest um, to better fit the client as well as the the military and we use that and that comes to us free of charge here are some of our measures i just put our 2016-17 there and you can see that the volume of students that we reach each and every year uh and that's just with the jrt's the 16 sites and what comes through the jrtc as far as training our students that we touch. Um, and these students are behind the fence as well as in the community. Some of the outcomes in particular with the Job Readiness Training Center. The Job Readiness Training Center, um, as you can see, nearly a thousand students that are involved in that program annually. And this program has have been in place for the last six years. In closing here, we don't do these things by ourselves. We have plenty of community partners and attacks are just a few of those community partners. This ends our portion of the briefing. Uh, on the uh, slide here is some of our points uh, of contact in case you need to get in contact with us with any questions or suggestions. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today for Employability Skills, a webinar for the NCDA constituency for private practice, business, industry, and agencies. Special thanks to our presenters, Courtney, Harold, and Robert. And of course, thank you to Dr. Sharon Givens for coordinating the webinar today. And I'm Marie Smith. I enjoyed being your tour guide. Employability skills. Thanks for watching.